Hello students. Today I want to briefly explain you about some principles of stratification by Kingsley Davis and Wilbert E. Moore. I am Mr. Samip Sinchuri and we'll begin the classes. Uh, the lesson objective is that the students will be able to explain the functional necessity of stratification and you'll also be able to describe the determinants of pro positional ranks and you'll also be able to explain societal function and stratification and by the end of this lesson you'll also be able to tell variations in stratified systems. In a previous paper or in previous lessons, some concepts for handling the phenomena of social inequality were presented. In the present uh, lesson, a further step in stratification theory is undertaken and an attempt to show the relationship between stratification and the rest of the social order starting from the proposition that no society is classless or unstratified an effort is made to explain in functional terms the universal necessity which calls forth stratification in any social system and next an attempt is made to explain the the rough uniform distribution of prestige as between the major types of positions in every society since however there occurs between one society and another great difference in the degree and kind of stratification some attention is also given in the varieties of social inequality and the variable functions that give rise to them. Clearly, the present task requires two different lines of analysis. One, to understand the universal. The other, to understand the variable features of stratification. Naturally, each line of inquiry adds the other and is indispensable. And in the treatment that follows the two, will be interwoven although because of some limitations the emphasis will be on the universals itself throughout it will be necessary to keep in mind one thing namely the discussion related to the system of position not to the universally occupied these positions it is one thing to ask why different position carry different degree of prestige and quite another to ask how certain individuals get into those positions. Although as the argument will try to show both questions and related, it is essential to keep them separate in our thinking most of the literatures on stratification has tried to answer the second question particularly with regard to the ease or difficulty of mobility between strata without tackling the first the first question however is logically prior and in the ease of any particular individual or group or factually prior. Curiously, however, the main functional necessity explaining the universal presence of stratification is precisely the requirement faced by any society of placing and motivating individuals in the social structure. According to Kingsley Davis and Wilbert E. Moore, as a functioning mechanism, a society must 
somehow distributes its member in social positions and induce them to perform the duties of this position it must thus concern itself with motivation at two different levels to instill in the proper individuals the desire to fill certain position and once in this position the desire to perform the duties attached to them even though the social order may be relatively static in form there is a continuous process of metabolism as new individuals are born into it shift with age and die off their absorption into the positional system must somehow be arranged and motivated and this is true whether the system is competitive or non competitive a competitive system gives greater importance to the motivation to achieve position whereas a non competitive system gives perhaps greater importance to the motivation to perform the duties of the positions but in any system both types of motivations are required if the duties associated with the various positions were all equally pleasant to the human organism all equally important to societal survival and all equally in need of the same ability or talent it would make some difference who got into which position and the problem of social placement would be greatly reduced but actually it does make a great deal of difference who gets into which position not only because some positions are inherently more agreeable than others but also because some requires special talents or training and some are functionally more important than others also it is essential that the duties of the positions be performed with the diligence that their importance requires inevitably then a society must have first some kind of rewards then it can use an inducement and second some way of distributing these rewards differentially according to position the rewards and their distribution become a part of the social order and thus gives rise to stratification one may ask what kind of reward a society has its disposal in distributing its personal and security essential services it has first of all the things that contribute to sustenance and comfort it has second the thing that contribute to humor and diversion and it has finally the thing that contribute to self respect and ego expansion the last because of the peculiarly social character of the self it is largely a function of the opinion of others but it nonetheless ranks in importance with the first two in any social system all three kinds of rewards must be dispensed differentially according to position in a sense the reward are built into the position they consist in the rights associated with the positions but what may be called is accompaniment
often uh, the right and sometimes the accompaniments are functionally related to the duties of the position that is rights are viewed by the incumbent are usually duties as viewed by other members of the community however there may be a host of subsidiary rights and prerequisites that are not essentially to the function of the position and have only an indirect and symbolic connection with the duties but which still may be of considerable importance in inducing people to seek the position and fulfill the essential duties if the rights and prerequisites of duty different positions in a society must be unequal then the society must be stratified because that is precisely what stratification means social inequality is thus an unconsciously evolved device by which societies ensure that the most important positions are consciously filled by the most qualified persons hence every society no matter how simple or complex must differentiate persons in terms of both prestige and esteem and must therefore possess a certain amount of institutionalized inequality it does not follow that the amount or type of inequality need be the same in all societies this is largely of functions or factors that will be discussed presently now granting the general function that inequality subserves one can specify the two factor that determines the relative rank of different positions in general those positions convey the best rewards and hence have the highest rank which have the great importance for the society and require the greatest training or talent the first factor concerns functions and is a matter of relative significance the second con- concerned means is a matter of scarcity now actually a society does not need to reward positions in proportion to their functional importance it merely needs to give sufficient rewards to them to ensure that they will be filled competently in other words according to davis and more it must be that less essential positions do not compete successfully with more essential ones if a position is easily filled it need not be heavily rewarded even though important on the other hand if it is important but hard to fulfill the reward must be high enough to get it filled anyway functional importance is therefore a necessary but not a sufficient cause of high rank being assigned to a position now practically all positions no matter how acquired required some forms of skill or capacity for performance this is implicit in the very notion of position which implies that a incumbent must by virtue of this incumbency accomplish certain things there are ultimately only two things in which a person's qualifies qualification can come about through inherent capacity or through training obviously in con- concrete activities both are always necessary 
but from a practical standpoint the scarcity may lie primarily in one or the other as well as in both some positions require innate talent of some high degree that the person will feel them are bound to be rare in many cases however talent is fairly abundant in the population but the training process is so long costly and elaborate that relatively few can qualify modern medicine for example is within the mental capacity of most individuals but a medical education is so burdensome and expensive that virtually none would undertake it if the position of the md did not carry a reward commensurate with the sacrifice similarly if the talents required for a position are abundant and the training is easy the method of acquiring the position may have little to do with its duty there may be in fact a virtually accidental relationship but if the skills required are scarce but reasons of the rarity of talent or, or the costliness of training the position if functionally important must have an attractive power that will draw the necessary skills in competition with other position this means in effect that the position must be high in the social scale must command great prestige high salary ample leisure and the like now how variations are to be understood in so far as there is a difference between one system of stratification and another it is attributable to whatever factors affect the two determinants of differential rewards namely functional importance and scarcity of personnel positions important in one society may not be important in another because the conditions faced by the societies or their degree of internal development may be different the same condition in turn may affect the questions of scarcity for in some societies the stage of development or the external situation may wholly obviate the necessity of certain kind of skill or talent any particular system of stratification then can be understood as a product of the special conditions affecting the two or four mentioned grounds of differential awards now talking about major societal functions and stratification the reason why religion is necessary is apparently to be found in the fact that human society achieves its unity primarily to the possession by its members of certain ultimate values and end in common although these values and ends are subjective they influence behavior and their integration enables the society to operate as a system derived neither from inherent nor from external nature they have evolved as a part of culture by communicating and moral pressure they must however appear to the members of the society to have some reality and it is the role of religion 
and ritual to supply and reinforce the appearance of reality. Though belief and ritual, the common ends and values are connected with an imaginary world symbolized by concrete sacred object which world in turn is related in a meaningful way to the fact and trials of the individual's life. Through the worship of the sacred objects and the beings they symbolize and the acceptance of supernatural prescriptions that are at the same time codes of behavior a powerful control over human conduct is exercised guiding it along lines sustaining the institutional structure and conforming to the ultimate ends and values and this conception of the role of religion is true one can understand why in every known society the religious activities tend to be under the charge of particular person who tend thereby to enjoy greater reward than the ordinary societal member certain of the rewards are special privileges may attach to only the highest religious functionaries but others usually apply if such exists to the entire sacerdotal class moreover there is a peculiar relation between the duties of the religious officials and the special privileges he enjoy if the supernatural world governs the destinies of men more ultimately than does the real world its earthly representative the persons through whom one may communicate with the supernatural must be a powerful individual he is a keeper of sacred tradition a skilled performer of the ritual and an interpreter of lore and myth he is in such close contact with the god that he is viewed as possessing some of their characteristics he is in short a bit sacred and hence free from some of the more vulgar necessities and controls it is not accident therefore that religious functionaries have been associated with the very highest positions of power and is theoretic regimes indeed looking at it from this point of view one may wonder why it is that they do not get entire control over their societies the factor that prevents these are worth of note in the first place the amount of technical competence necessary for the performance of religious duties is small scientific or artistic capacity is not required anyone can set himself up as enjoying an intimate relation with deities and nobody can successfully dispute him therefore the factor of scarcity of personnel does not operate in the technical sense one may assert on the other hand that religious rituals is often elaborate and religious lore abstruse and that priestly ministrations requires tact if not intelligence this is true but the technical requirement of the professions are for the most part adventitious not related to the end in the same way that science is related to air travel the priest can never be free from competition since the criteria of whether or not one has genuine contact with the supernatural are never strictly clear it is this competition that 
debase the priestly position below what might be expected at first glance. That is why priestly prestige is highest in those societies where membership in the profession is rigidly controlled by the priestly guild itself. That is why in part at least elaborate Devices are utilized to stress the identification of the person with his office, spectacular costume, abnormal conduct, special diets, segregated residence, celibacy, conspicuous leisure, and the like. In fact, the priest is always in danger of becoming somewhat discreted as happening in a secularized society. Because in a world of stubborn facts, rituals and sacred knowledge alone will not grow crops or build house. Furthermore, unless he is protected by a professional guild, the, priest identifi the priest's identification with the supernatural tends to preclude his acquisitions of abundant worldly gods. As between one society and another, it seems that the highest general position awarded the priest occurs in the medieval type of social order. Here, there is enough economic production to afford a surplus, which can be used to support a numerous and highly organized priesthood. And yet, the populace in an unlittered and therefore credulous to a High degree. Perhaps the most extreme example is to be found in, in the Buddhism of Tibet, but others are encouraged in the Catholicism of feudal Europe, the Inca regime of Peru, the Brahminism of India, and the Mayan priesthood of Yuc Yucatan. On the other hand, if the society is so crude as to have no surplus and little differentiation, so that every priest must be also a cultivator or hunter, this separation of the priestly status from the others has hardly gone far enough for priestly prestige to mean much. When the priest actually has high much, when the priest actually has high prestige under this circumstances, it is because he also performs other important functions, usually political and medical in an extreme extremely advanced society built on scientific technology the priesthood tends to lose status because sacred traditions and supernaturalism drop into the background the ultimate values and common ends of the society tend to be expressed in lens anthropomorphic ways but officials who occupy fundamentally political economic or educational rather than religious positions nevertheless it is easily possible for intellectuals to exaggerate the degree to which the priesthood in a presumably secular as lost prestige when the matter is closely examined the urban proletariat as well as the ruler citizenry proves to be surprising god fearing and priest ridden no society has become so completely secularized as to liquidate entirely the belief in transcendental ends and super, supernatural entities even in a secularized society, some system must exist for the integration of ultimate value for their ritualistic expansion and for the emotional adjustments required for disappointment, death and disaster. Like religion, 
government play a unique and indispensable part in society. But in contrast to religion, which provides integration in terms of sentiments, beliefs and rituals, it organizes the society in terms of law and authority. Furthermore, it orients the society to actual rather than unseen world. The main functions of government are in internally the ultimate enforcement of norms, the final attribution of conflicting interest and the overall planning and direction of society and externally the handling of war and diplomacy to carry out these functions it acts as the agent of the entire people enjoying a monopoly of force and controls all individuals within its territory political action by definition implies authority and on an official can command because he has authority and the citizen must obey because he is subject to that authority for this reason stratification is inherent in the nature of political relationships so clear is the power embodied in political position that political inequality is sometimes thought to comprise all inequalities. But it can be shown that there are other bases of stratification that the following controls operate in practice to keep political power from become, becoming complete. Number one is the fact that the actual holders of political office and especially those determining top policy must necessarily be few in numbers as compared to the total population. Secondly, the fact that the rules represent the interests of the group rather than of themselves and are therefore restricted in their behavior by rules and mores designed to enforce these limitations of interest. And thirdly, the fact that the holder of po political office has his authority by virtue of his office and nothing else. And therefore, any special knowledge, talent or capacity he may claim is purely incidental so that he often has to depend upon others for technical assistance. In view of these limiting factors, it is not strange that the rules often have less power and prestige than a literal enumeration of their former rights would lead one to expect. Every position that secures for its incumbent a livelihood is by definition economically rewarded. For this reason, there is an economic aspect to those positions, political and religious, the, the main function of which is not economic. It therefore becomes convenient for the society to use unequal economic returns as a principal means of controlling the entrance of persons into position and stimulating the performance of their duties. The amount of the economic return therefore becomes one of the main indices of social status. It should be stressed, however, that a position does not bring power and prestige because, because it draws a high income. Rather, it draws a high income because it is functionally important and the available personnel is for one reason or another scarce. It is therefore 
superficial and erroneous to regard high income as the cause of man's power and prestige, just as it is erroneous to think that a man's fever is the cause of his disease. The economic source of power and prestige is not income primarily, but the ownership of capital goods, including patent, goodwill, and professional reputation. Such ownership should be distinguished from the possession of consumer's good, which, which is an index rather than a cause of social standing. In other words, the ownership of producer's good is, properly speaking, a source of income like other positions, the income itself remaining an index. Even in situations where social values are widely commercialized and earnings are the readiest method of judging some position, income does not confer prestige on a position so much as it induces people to compete for the position. It is true that a man who has a high income as a result of one position may find this money helpful in climbing into another position as well, but this again reflects the effect of his initial economically advantageous status which exercises its influence through the medium of money. In a system of private property, in productive enterprise and income over what an individual spends can give rise to possessions of capital wealth. Presumably, such possession is a reward for the proper management of one's financial originally and of the productive enterprise later. But at social differentiation becomes highly advanced and yet the institutions of inheritance persist, the phenomena of pure ownership and reward for pure ownership emerges. In such a case, it is difficult to prove that the position is functionally important or that the scarcity involves is anything other than extrinsic and accidental. It is for this reason, doubtless, that the institutions of private property is productive goods because more subjects to criticism as social development proceeds towards industrialization. It is only this pure that is strictly legal and functionless ownership however this is open to attack for some form of activity ownership whether private or public is indispensable one kind of ownership of production goods cons consist in rights over the labor of other the most extremely Concentrated and exclusive of such rights are found in slavery, but the essential principle remains in serfdom, peonage, and comenda, and indenture. Naturally, this kind of ownership has the greatest significance for stratification because it necessarily entails an unequal relationship. But property in capital goods inevitably introduces a compulsive elements even into the nominal free contractual relationship. Indeed, in some respect, the authority of the contractual employer is greater than that of the feudal landlord, inasmuch as the latter is more limited by traditional reciprocities. Even the classical economies recognize the competitors would fare unequally, but 
it did not pursue this fact to its necessary uh, conclusion that however it might be acquired unequal control of goods and services must give unequal advantages to the parties to a contract the function of finding meaning to single goal without any concern with the choice between goals is the exclusively technical sphere the explanation of why positions require great technical skill receives fairly high reward in easy to see for it is the simplest case of the reward being so distributed as to draw talent and motivate training why they seldom if every receives if ever receives the highest uh, reward is also clear the importance of technical knowledge from a societal point of view is never so great as the integration of goal which takes place on the religious political and economic level since the technological level is concerned solely with means a purely technical position must ultimately be subordinated to other positions that are religious political or economic in character nevertheless the distinctions between expert and layman in any social order is fundamental and cannot be entirely reduced to other terms methods of recru- recruitment as well as of reward sometimes lead to the erroneous interpretation that technical positions are economically determined actually however the acquisitions of knowledge and skill cannot be accomplished by purchase although the opportunity to learn may be the control of the avenue of training may inherent as a sort of property right in certain families or classless giving them power and prestige in consequence such a situation as an artificial scarcity to the natural scarcity of skill and talents on the other hand it is possible for a opposite situation to arise the reward of technical position may be so great that a condition of excess supply is cre- created leading to at least temporary devaluation of the reward thus unemployment in the learned profession may result in a debasement of the prestige of those positions such adjustments and readjustments are constantly occurring in changing societies and it is always well to bear in mind that the efficiency of a stratified society may be affected by the modes of recruitment for positions the society order itself however sets limits to the inflation or deflation of the prestige of experts and oversupply tend to debase the rewards and discourage recruitment or produce revolution whereas an undersupply tend to increase the reward or weaken the society in competition with other societies particular system of stratification so a wide range with respect to the exact position of technically competent persons this range is perhaps more evident in the degree of specialization extreme division of labor tend to create many specialists without high prestige since the training in short and the required native cap- capacity relatively small on the other hand it also tends to accentuate the high position of the true experts scientists engineers and administrators by increasing 
uh, their authority relative to other functionally important positions. But the idea of, now, of a technocratic social order or a government or priesthood of engineers or social scientists neglects the limitations of knowledge and skills as a basic for performing social functions to the extent that the social structure is truly specialized the prestige of the technical person must also be circumscribed the general principle of stratification here suggests forms a necessary preliminary to a consideration of types of stratified system because it is in terms of this principle that the type must be described this can be seen by trying to delineate types according to certain modes of variation for instance some of the most important modes together with the polar type in terms of them seem to be as follows the degree of specialization affects the finest and multiplicity of the gradations in power and prestige it also influences the extent to which particular functions may be emphasized in the invidious system since a given function cannot receive much emphasis in the hierarchy until it has achieved structural separations from the other functions finally the amount of specialization influence the basis of selection like polar types specialized and unspecialized in general when emphasis is put on sacred matter or rigidity is introduced that tends to limit specialization and hence the development of technology in addition a break in place on social mobility and on the development of bureaucracy when the preoccupation with the sacred is withdrawn leaving great scope for purely secular preoccupations a great development and rise in status of economic and technological position seemingly takes place curiously a concomitant rise in political position is not alike because it has usually been allied with the religious and stands to gain little by the decline of the latter it is also possible for a society to emphasize family functions as in relatively undifferentiated societies where high morality requires high mortality requires high fertility and kinship forms the main basis of social organization main types are uh, familistic authoritarian or theocratic or sacred and uh, tot totalitarian or secular or capitalistic what may be called the amount of social distance between positions taking into account the entire scale is sometimes that should lend itself to qualitative measures that is the magnitude of invidious differences considerable differences apparently exist between uh, different societies in this regard and also different parts of the same societies uh, that is Uh, in equalitarian society the familiar question of the amount of mobility is different from the question of the comparatively equality or inequality of reward posed above because the two criteria 
may vary uh, independently up to a point. For instance, the tremendous divergences in monetary income in the United States are far greater than those found in primitive societies. Yet the equality of opportunity to move from one wrong to the other in this social scale may also be greater in the United States than in a hereditary tribal kingdom that is uh, mobile open and immobile that is closed we can see that between the American society and the traditional uh, hereditary tribal kingdom again the degree of class solidarity or the presence of special organizations to promote class interests may vary to some extent independently of the other criteria and hence it hence is an important principle in classifying systems of stratification between the class organized and the class organ unorganized when we are talking about some external factors uh, you know what state and particular system of stratification is in with reference to each of these modes of variation and these modes of variation depends on two things each state with reference to the other range of variation and the condition outside the system of stratification which nevertheless influences the system and among the latter are the following the stage of cultural development as the cultural heritage grows increased uh, specialization becomes necessary which in turn contributes to the enhancement of mobility a decline of stratum uh, solidarity and a change of functional emphasis and situations with respect to other societies the presence or absence of open conflict with other societies or free trade relations or cultural diffusions all influence the class structure to some extent a chronic state of welfare tends to place emphasis upon the military functions especially when the opponents are more or less equal free trade or the other hand uh, strengthens the hands of the trader at the expense of the warrior and police free movements of ideas generally has an uh, equalitarian effect Migra migration and conquest create special circumstances as well and uh, a small society limits the degree to which functional specialization can go that is the size of the society and the degree of segregation of different strata and the magnitude of inequality much of the literature on stratification has attempted to classify concrete system into a certain numbers of types this task is depictable simply however and should come uh, at the end of an analysis of elements and principle rather than at the beginning if the preceding uh, discussion has an uh, validity it uh, indicates that there are a number of modes of variation between different systems and that any one system is a composite of the so society's status with reference to all those modes of variation the danger of trying to uh, classify whole society under such rubrics as caste feudals or open uh, open class is that one of the two criteria are selected and others are ignored the result being an unsatisfactory solution to the problem posed the present discussion has been offered as a possible approach to more systematic uh, classifications of composite types